All right, well, great. If you have your Bibles, let's open them up to 1 Chronicles chapter 16. So we continue on working through the book of Chronicles. And again, as always, just great, uh, rich truths to live by. And um, let's pray and ask God to bless it. Father, <clears throat> Father, we thank you, Lord, for tonight. And again, your word is so rich and so full. And, and Lord, it is our anchor and it is our uh, foundation. It's everything. It's our direction, it's our life, it's our breath. Everything, Lord, your word is, um, is what we need, and it's everything we, we desire, Lord. I just pray you'd help us to understand, Lord, how important your word is in our life, and give us a greater and greater desire for your word, because it is truly where life is, for you are the word. And so I pray now, Lord, that as we look at uh, the continuing life and adventures of David, God, speak to us about the life you've given us and the adventures you've called us to do for your kingdom. And we thank you for the honor and the privilege it is, God, not just to know you, but to serve you. And we pray now tonight that you would intervene by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would feed your people, and you would just teach us your word, Lord. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we get to chapter 16 of 1 Chronicles, remember where we left off last time. David had now brought the ark in, finally done it the right way. He wanted to bring the ark in. He wanted God's presence, which again, the ark is where God met with God's people. And he wanted the ark to be in the center of the nation. He wanted it to be the center of their capital. Of course, the city of David and eventually becoming Jerusalem would be the capital of Jerusalem. It's been for over 3,000 years and the center of their nation. And he wanted it to be in the middle of the nation. And by the way, you can't have a better place for God than in the center of your nation. And that's one of the things that grieves me because we started out that way, but we're getting away from that. And now we're seeing the consequences in our nation of removing God from the center of our nation. David said, I want God to be in the center of the nation. But I want you to note that David first, he took the Ark of the Covenant where God's presence met with man and he established that first. And then after that was established, God established David. That is a powerful truth you need to let sink down into your heart because God does the same thing with us today. You know, we talked about what an adventure it is to look at David's life and all that God did with David. But David is now with the Lord in the kingdom. We are now the representatives of God on the earth. We're the Davids of modern day. Now we don't run nations and we're not maybe in the position David was in such as maybe a president or leader of the world might be, but we are God's representatives on the earth in this generation. David is gone. These guys are all gone. It's us now. So God's not done. He didn't say, well, David's gone. Uh, all of his mighty men are gone. What do I do now? Just wait till you know, I come back and rule the earth. No, he said, I'm going to raise up generation after generation of believers. They're going to be my Davids. They'll be my Joabs. They'll be my Jeremiahs. They'll be my Ezekiels. They'll be my leaders. And I'm going to raise them up. Well, you're, this, here you are. And so it's not just an adventure for David. It's an adventure for you if you grab a hold of it. Say, God, I want to be a part of this. I want to be a part of what you're doing in my generation. You know, it goes by really quick. I mean, we're here and then boom, we're gone. And so we need to grab a hold of it and make it count. And David did that. And one of the key things we have to learn right off the bat here is that David first established God as the center of everything. Then David was established. We have to establish God at the center of our life first. And once God is established first, everything else will fall into place. It's been said that if we take care of the vertical, the horizontal will fall into place. And I've found that to be true. Oftentimes we have so many things going on on the horizontal, you know, this problems in you know, work, with the family, with friends, with life, with whatever, you know, name it, all these problems here. And we get so focused on all these problems that we're moving from problem to problem horizontally going, how do I fix all this? And maybe some of you are there tonight. And God says, just stop and look up. Get me planted first in the middle of everything, securely, go vertical. And once you go vertical, I'll take care of the horizontal. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added that you need. So we have to get our focus on the Lord and let him take care of all the other details. David did that. God had called David, David knew it. David did the first thing. He put God at the center of everything. And now we're gonna see that God says, now that you've done that, I'm gonna now establish you, David. Now, before we get to that, which is really in chapter 17, where God's gonna to talk to David about that. In chapter 16, we see David offering a psalm up, David being a writer of music, a writer of song. And now giving it to the worship leaders there and having them a psalm that day. And we're going to see they all rejoice in that. And I thank God for people that can write music and those that can write psalms and those that can use God's word and write stuff for us today. Because that's not an ability that I have. It's not an ability that many of us have. What a blessing it is to be able to express ourselves in song to the Lord. 
And, and you know, it's, if you're not expressing yourself in song to the Lord, I'm just going to say, it, you're missing out. If you never sing and you just stand there, um, you know, you're missing out. God's designed you to cry out to the Lord. He's designed you to, to have this experience with God. It's a part of who we are, and it's a part of our expression to God. And so God raises up people that can write songs, and they can sing songs, and they can play songs. And we worship God, and it feels so good when you're in that thing. You're worshiping, and you're giving God praise. You're expressing your heart. You're singing the word back to him. You're showing him that love. Something happens in the, in the life of a believer. And again, I'm not talking about different personality types. You know, you say, well, I'm not very expressive. You don't have to be expressive to sing. And I don't want to, you know, again, you've heard probably people say this often, but I'll say it again. You don't even have to be a good singer. I mean, again, you know, the, you know he, he does say make a joyful noise. And we've all heard that as believers, right? Kind of an old Christian joke. But he says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. He didn't say make a beautiful melody. And so don't think, well, I can't sing, so I won't. No, you need to sing and you need to offer it up to the Lord. It's something that you just need to learn to do. I encourage you to ask God to give you the boldness to do it. If you're not doing it in the, in the gathering of believers, do it in the gathering of believers. If you wanna start doing it in the privacy of your home, do it in the privacy of your home and, and um, entertain your neighbors. Whatever, however you wanna do this, go for it, go for it. Because it truly is a blessing of the Lord. We're gonna see that David jumps into this here when we get to verse seven. But chapter 16, verse one, so they brought the ark of God and set it in the midst of the tabernacle that David had erected for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. Remember the burnt offerings? They represented giving your all to God. Everything. You burned it all up. There was nothing left. You literally put the whole animal on there, burned every bit of it. And it represented before God, I'm giving you everything I am. I'm holding nothing back. You've got all of me. And I love the order of this because you see this even in the order of the priests and all through the Old Testament. You don't have the peace offering until after the burnt offering. Or you can offer a peace offering, but in the proper order he laid out, the burnt offering is the one that comes first because you've got to first offer yourself completely to God before you have that peace with God. And if you're saying tonight, well, I don't have peace with God, let me ask you this. Have you, have you given yourself as a burnt offering unto the Lord? Have you said, I'm yours. Do with me as you want. Because once you do that, God will begin to work in your life to make you that peace offering. So David offers burnt offerings. He offers peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Isn't that great? You know, when you're filled with the Spirit and you've given yourself completely to the Lord. And I've seen this as a result. Look, if you give yourself completely to God, you'll find yourself blessing others. It is a natural outcropping of who you are. You just, Lord, I'm yours. I love you. I'm learning to sing praise to you. I'm giving you praise and glory. I just, and you, re, you, meet, you run into people. Hey, I'm great to see you. How are you doing? Let me pray for you. It just comes out. And so this is what David's doing. David's filled with the Spirit. He's offering God everything. He's now blessing the people. And how wonderful it is to be around people like this that are filled with the Spirit and blessing. You know, don't you love to be around people like that? And I love this too, because David knew that we like to eat. And he distributed to everyone of Israel, both man and woman, and to everyone a loaf of bread, a piece of meat, and a cake of raisins. I love it. He gave a great piece of that Israeli bread, you know, that Middle Eastern bread that's great, uh, kind of looks like a, it, I, I hate to even say tortilla because it just doesn't do it justice. And I like tortillas. Don't get me wrong. If you, you know, if you like tortillas, I'm not downing tortillas. They're great. But this is kind of something different where it's like this kind of thicker than tortilla, softer and has bubbles in the bread. And it's like, anyway, this kind of stuff, they make it over in the Middle East. I love it. And no doubt it was that kind of bread, a piece of meat. You know, he's, again, you're the men there. They need some meat. And that's part of it. You know, you got to make the men happy. And a cake of raisins. That's, that's dessert. David basically, he had a church picnic. He did. All the meat came from the sacrifices. He had a big church gathering in downtown Miraville at the Beltway, right? Greenway, green belt, whatever. Uh, Beltway's actually in Washington, right? The green belt. It says it two ways online, green belt and, and greenway. So either way. But had a big picnic. Offered everybody the food. Gave them the meat. Got all the burgers out there and all the whatever that went with that. Then gave them some dessert. And there, it's, just a, it's just a blessed time uh, in celebrating the Lord, which it always is when you give everything to the Lord. It's always just a blessed time. And he appointed some of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord to commemorate, to thank, and to praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, next to him was Zechariah, then Jael, and Shemeramoth, Jahiel, Mattathiah, Eliab, Benaiah, and Obed-Edom. Jael with stringed instruments and harps, uh, and Asaph made music with cymbals. And Benaiah and Jehaziel, the priests, regularly blew the trumpets before the Ark of the Covenant of God. You know, when these guys worshiped, you heard them. I mean, worship was not quiet in Israel. I'm just going to say that. All right. I'm not, 
saying that we need to be blowing people's ears out. But I'm saying, when you read the, but they were, they were banging cymbals. They were blowing trumpets. They were playing the stringed instruments. They were, they, they were singing. It says in some places they shouted so loud that you could hear them in the surrounding areas. So, I mean, when these guys had a worship time, they had a worship time. And David now gives them a brand new song of thanksgiving. Uh, one of the, a psalm of David here. And again, the sweet psalmist of Israel writing this music and having this gift. And now the people being able to express themselves in this way, this, again, beautiful gift. And now being able to offer to God uh, the praises in song and actually making noise unto the Lord. And so it is a blessing to the Lord for us to sing and to let it come out of us. He, he enjoys it. And he's ordained it that way. It says, on that day, David first delivered this psalm into the hand of Asaph and his brethren to thank the Lord. Hey, I got a brand new one. God gave me a new one, man. No, here it is, a brand new. Get up there, put some music to it. Let's go, you know, and worship the Lord. And here goes Asaph. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. He's saying, hey, look, you give him thanks and let people know how great he is. God wants us to declare his praises and who he is and how wonderful he is. He says, do that. Don't be afraid to do that. Sing to him. Here he goes. Here's the encouragement. It's not just me saying it. God's saying, you need to sing. Sing to him. Sing psalms to him. Talk of his wondrous works. Uh, works. I love it. You were to sing, were to talk, uh, everything about the Lord. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. And when you seek the Lord, your heart will rejoice. It's just, a, again, a byproduct. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works, which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word which he commanded for a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath to Isaac and confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying to you, I give the land of Canaan. Now, again, before I even comment on that, notice what he's doing. Again, he's just telling what God has done. He's reminding the people of God's promises, of God's greatness of what God is, is offering. He's giving all this thing. This is what our God has done. And what a great way, what a great look for songs or just talking about God, remembering his promises and remembering what he's done in the past is what gives us encouragement for the future because we remember God's faithfulness. David's doing all that. And then he says in verse 18, to you, that is to the nation of Israel, to the descendants of Abraham, I give the land of Canaan as an allotment of your inheritance. You've heard me say it over and over and over, but who does the land belong to? Well, the land, the land belongs to God. It's God's land, but God has given it to Israel to inhabit as an everlasting promise. And that hasn't worn out. It's not, God's not done with Israel. He hasn't turned the land over to someone else. Right now, Israel's fighting for the land that they have, and they've been kicked out because of their sin. God's now bringing them back into the land. They don't have near the land they had when David was king, and they don't have, even when David was king, not, they didn't have near the land they're going to have when Jesus comes back. Israel's going to be much larger. We're going to see that, as it talks about the, the areas that David conquered, and I guess I'll get a little bit ahead of myself, it goes all the way up to Iran. It covers everything from Israel all the way down to the Nile, from Egypt, all the way across past Iraq over to the border of Iran. That's the territory that David had on the nation of Israel when David was king. This was a mighty empire. It wasn't just like little Israel and David's their king. You got to realize at their peak, he said, I'm going to make you like the great men of the earth. He was, he was ruling over the majority of the Middle East. Gigantic kingdom that David had. And yet it still wasn't all that God's promised to the nation, but God gave it to David. He said, I've promised you this land. Um, it's interesting when people talk about the West Bank, and they give it that terminology politically because they act like it's the West Bank of, of land that Israel really shouldn't be in. It's not the West Bank. If you want to go hundreds of miles beyond that, and that's what God's given them. That's all Israel. And so I know it's political today, but God says, no, that I've given it to you as an allotment for your inheritance. When you were few in number, indeed very few, and strangers in the land. When they went from one nation to another and from one kingdom to another people, he permitted no man to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes. Uh, you think about Abraham and the rebuke that God gave when uh, the whole situation with Sarah, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. God, our defender. I love it. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among the peoples. So there it is again. Declare it. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. 
He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols. In other words, they're fake. But the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and gladness are in his place. You want honor, you want majesty, you want strength. It's found in Jesus. He has it all. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Guys, let's, let's just soak on that for a second. The beauty of holiness. You know, holiness is beautiful. Holiness is beautiful. You know, there is something about a godly person that it's just nice to be around. And it doesn't matter. You know, when it talks about the beauty of holiness, you can see it on people. It doesn't matter what they look like in the physical realm. There's a beauty of holiness. And, and it's walking in that purity and holiness of the Lord, and it sets people apart. You know, remember, holiness is not what a lot of people think it is. It simply means you're living for the Lord and you're set apart for Him. You're living for Him, you're set apart for Him. That's holy. It's not how you talk or how you dress or, or those kind of things. It's simply, I'm, I'm the Lord's, I've given myself to Him, I burn offering unto the Lord, I belong to Him. And there's a beauty that comes with that. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, again, just seeing, seeing the Lord, you know, on Tracy, that's very attractive to me. There's just a beauty to it. There's a sweetness to it, a richness. And to see it on the Lord and to see it on you guys, it's, you know, it's, 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 even, it's appealing even on men. You know, it may not be attractive in the sense of a husband to a wife, and then, but even on men, you, you're just like, you want to be around guys like that. There's something special about somebody walking with the Lord and you want to be near them because you want, what have you got? I want, I want some of that. I want to learn how to be that way. I want to, I want to grow in that. And I, I just, we just got back from the pastor's conference out West and I get around some of these older believers that have gone before us and, you know, maybe been doing this, you know, 10, 20 years longer or whatever, and just seeing the Lord there life. And I said, like, Lord, I want to be like, you know, I want to be like you, but grow me like that. You know, I want to be for the next generation, what these guys are for me, because they're an inspiration. And I want to point people to Jesus, but I want them to see that this is real and there's real power. And there's a, there's a beauty and an allurement to living for God. It's attractive. The beauty of holiness, what a beautiful phrase. I love it. Tremble before him all the earth. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. And we will be saying that. We say it now and we are to say it now, but he will really be reigning when he comes back over all the nations. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field rejoice and all that's in it. Then the trees of the woods shall rejoice before the Lord for he is coming to judge the earth. You know, it's interesting. Let the trees rejoice and the plants because no, number one knows he is coming. He's, made the, he's, he's coming, you know, again, people have been saying that forever. Well, he is. We don't know when it's going to be, but the Lord's coming. We continue to proclaim that until he does come because he's coming back. His word's clear on that. But also note here, it says the trees shall rejoice before him. Trees of the woods. I know that men are sometimes referred to as, as trees symbolically in scripture, but there is something about nature. And we've talked about it that is, is, is alive to God in some way. I don't quite get it. They don't have souls. It's not like us, you know, you you don't want to make your best friend a flower or anything. But there is something about nature and animals and the response of, of the way that you interact with them and what you pour into them. And, and um, it just, it, there's something there. I mean, even they say they can even do tests. They can hook them up to different meters and, they, and plants respond to the way you treat them. And the things you say to them, it's really bizarre. It's like, you know, I don't know what that's about, but it's pretty cool. And I think it's just the life, somehow nature itself and all the animals, they understand God. They're connected to God in some way. And um, again, it's a beautiful thing, the way the creation, I think we're all just going to be so just amazed in the kingdom. When we see really what's been going on and what's really happening around us, um, I think we're going to just say, you're kidding. You know, this is just amazing to me. And so... Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. And say, save us, O God of our salvation. Gather us together and deliver us from the Gentiles to give thanks to your holy name, to triumph in your praise. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And all the people said, amen. You've heard that said before. 
Here's in the scripture, all the people said, amen, and they praised the Lord. Again, David was a great leader. He was a great worship leader. He turned people's eyes to the Lord and began to point out God's greatness. And when you begin to point God's greatness out, people naturally praise, you know, which is really what a worship leader does. It's what a pastor does. It's what anybody who's walking with the Lord, as you're lifting his name up and talking about him, it's what happens. So he left Asaph and his brothers there before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to minister before the Ark regularly as every day's work required. Remember we talked about how David had people there employed to work in the temple. He had worship teams there in the temple with the worship, you know, going around the clock. And uh, Obed-Edom with his 68 brethren. Remember, these are the guys that were involved in helping bring the Ark in, including Obed-Edom, the son of Jeduthun. Uh, and Hosa to be gatekeepers, that is to watch the doors, these massive doors they open. Uh, and the gatekeepers at this time, they didn't have the temple built, so the massive doors are later. These were just gatekeepers to the temple. But they'll eventually build these massive doors, and the gatekeepers of the future had these huge doors that would open and close every night. This, they were just basically in charge of the, the tent and watching the doors at this time. And Zadok the priest and his brethren the priest before the tabernacle of the Lord at the high place that was there at Gibeon to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offering, regular morning and evening, to do according to all that is written in the law of the Lord, which he had commanded Israel. Now there was a tabernacle, David sent a tent up, a tabernacle tent, if you will, there over the ark on the temple mount. But at this time, the official tabernacle was over at Gibeon, which is where Saul was from. Remember, it was at Shiloh when they first came in. It was at Shiloh for over 300 years. But remember, Eli, uh, you know, and his sons sinned against God. The ark was lost. Shiloh was destroyed and fell. And Samuel, that whole thing with Samuel, those who have been going through the Bible with us, you're aware of this. At that time, the ark was put away, remember, in kirjath Jerim for years. And then they were no longer meeting at the tabernacle there at Shiloh. They moved it to where Saul was, there at Gibeon. So now David brings the ark here, puts a tent over it for a tabernacle there, so to speak. And then the other official tabernacle was there at Gibeon, uh, where Saul had placed it after the ark had been removed from Shiloh. And so that's why it's talking about the, the ark here and all that they were doing uh, in relation to that at Gibeon. It says to offer burnt offerings to the Lord on the altar of burnt offering regularly morning and evening and to do according to all that's written in the law of the Lord, which he commanded Israel. And with them, Heman and Jeduthun and the rest who were chosen were designated by name to give thanks to the Lord because his mercy endures forever. And with them, Heman and Jeduthun, to sound aloud with trumpets and cymbals and the musical instruments of God. And the sons of Jeduthun were gatekeepers. So working there, the family, you know, all working there at the temple. What a great setup that would be. I love it. And by the way, let me just say this. You look all through scripture. I, I, you know, we've never had that issue here because, um, well, I mean, we, just, we haven't. But um, I hear from time to time, you know, you see pastors that have sons. And they'll put their son on staff as a pastor on staff and maybe start grooming him up to be the pastor to take over when he's gone or whatever. And some, from time to time, you hear people say, well, I don't think that's right. I think nepotism in the church. That's all you find in Scripture. All through the Scripture, it's families involved in the work of the ministry. Dads and their sons, dads and their daughters. Um, you know, the whole, the, God's establishment of Moses. He had Moses as, as the prophet, if you will, and the leader of the nation. He had Aaron as his son, as the pastor of the, or Aaron, his brother, as the pastor of the church. Miriam, the sister, was the women's ministry leader. So it's not an issue here, but if you ever hear somebody say that, that, we see this example all through Scripture. There's nothing wrong with family working together in ministry. As a matter of fact, I think it's great. I think it's great. Um, and that's what he's doing here. All the sons of Jeduthun working there at the temple, beautiful thing. The people departed every man to his house and David returned to bless his house. Now, something I wanna note before we get into chapter 17, they made the offerings, it says there in verse 40, regularly morning and evening. Regularly morning and evening. I, I think that pattern is still in place today that God would have us do. Not by law. What am I talking about? They would offer a lamb every morning and a lamb every evening and, and making an offering to the Lord. Jesus is the lamb. He is the word of God. I think when you get up and you spend time in the word, you're making that morning offering to God. You're opening up the word of God. You're opening up the lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. He is the word, John chapter one, verse one. And you're just making an offering. Say, God, I'm just gonna read you. And I'm going to offer up myself and offer up your son and offer up praise. And so you're making that morning offering. And why do I say that? Because I think it's a good 
a habit for you to get into, not a good a habit. I don't know why I said that. It's a good a habit to get that a done for you. No, it's a good habit to get done. Public speaking is an interesting thing. If you've never done it, I know, I know I get criticized. You're the word he said. And I think sometimes I say crazy things and I find out later. So have grace on me. I usually know what I'm saying. I just say the wrong words. But the bottom line is, is that, now see, now I've got sidetracked. I'm talking about the good habit. That's what it is. It's a pattern that God sets. Why? Start the day in the word and end the day in the word. And don't overburden yourself. And it's like, oh man, I, you know, I spent all this time in the word this morning. Whatever. I'm not saying overburden yourself. I'm saying make a morning offering and before you go to bed. Go to the Lamb again. Open up the word of God and make an evening offering. And, and, and Why? Because God says to, when he tells Joshua, when he comes in the land, he says, Joshua, I'm going to give you right now the keys to being successful and prospering in every way you go. And he wasn't talking about financial prospering. He's talking about spiritual prospering. He said, here's what you do. He said, morning, meditate in my word when? Morning and night. And what he was teaching Joshua is, Joshua, even as I have the priest, by example, giving a morning and evening sacrifice, I want you to give a morning and evening sacrifice. Be in my word, meditate in my word, morning and night. And if you meditate in my word, morning and night, you're going to be prosperous. If you have trouble sleeping, get up and read a couple chapters of the word. You're awake anyway, just read the word. You know, let God's word, you know, start washing or whatever. And of course, hopefully you do that before you even go to bed. But if you can't, that's a great thing to do to get up. And I've had nights where I just can't sleep or whatever. And I'll get up and spend a little time in the word and then just go back to bed or whatever. And I'll tell you another good thing to do is, is when you go to bed, count sheep. And I mean it. I mean, just start praying for the brothers and sisters in the Lord. You know, as they, as they jump by, yeah, yeah. Lord, pray for Joe, help him, whatever. Yeah, there's that surgery tomorrow for you. Know, and you pray for sheep. And you begin to just get tired. You, it, 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 I've done that a few times, and you just doze off in the middle of it. So if you're at the front of the flock, you got prayed for. If you're at the back, I'm sorry, you didn't get prayed for. <laughs> whatever your need, the greatest need was at the front, right? But um, it just great Great biblical principles. And again, for moms and dads, when you have kids, you know, try to, try to instill this in their heart, you know, early on. Try to teach them that, you know. And, and um, you know, you don't have to do a devotion with them morning and night. The way I did it with the girls is I would do one, you know, one with them in the evening. I'd, I'd say, try to encourage them, okay, in the morning, read the word before you go or do whatever. Encouraging them to do that or whatever. And now, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you kind of get that, that habit established. And, of course, by the time they get older and they're, hitting 18, 19, 20, and 20 something years old, they're not oftentimes even around to do a devotional with, whether it be evening or morning or whatever. But if you've taught them all these things growing up, they're gonna continue that on to some degree. And even if they veer off from that, I think when they get older, that's something they were, God pulls us back to those roots, you know? So morning and evening offering, I encourage you, make that morning and evening offering. And I still do it today. I do it. Before I go to bed, I'll grab the word and read me a chapter, do whatever. I just, and, and not, not as a legalistic thing and not doing, you know, like the, the, you know, the prayer you've got to make, you know, make God, it's not making God happy. It's making that evening offering so that we can grow and prosper and, and be used in greater ways. Chapter 17, it came to pass when David was dwelling in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, see now I dwell in a house of cedar, which by the way was a great thing back then. It, it's still a good thing today, but cedar was a big deal back then to get that wood and make homes out of it. Great smell, uh, non-rotting for the most part. of just a great wood to use. He said, I, I dwell in a house of cedar. God's blessed me tremendously with my home would be a modern application. But the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under tent curtains. He's like, my house is great, but the church didn't look so good. And I'm feeling convicted about that because I've been pouring all my money into my own home and not really doing it into the church. Might be a modern application. But we're going to see that to God, it's not about a fancy church. I, I think we should certainly give and I think we should certainly tithe. And I think there's a principle there in honoring God. But we're going to see that he tells David, look, it's not about the building. It's about the relationship. But David recognizes, I haven't really done much for the tabernacle. And Nathan said to David, and this again, remember, Nathan was a prophet, but Nathan didn't always speak for God. He, Nathan just spoke for Nathan a lot of times. Whenever he spoke for God, God would speak to him and he would say, thus saith the Lord. But they were good friends. So these guys would be hanging out. There's Nathan with David. And they're just being together. And David, no doubt, loved his counsel and sought his counsel. Even when he wasn't speaking for God and speaking the word of God, Nathan was wise because God was a, would speak to him and give him wisdom and direct him. And they're there together. And, he, and David just says that to him. You know, Nathan, look at this. Look at my place and look, look at God's house. 
And Nathan said to David, do all that's in your heart, for God is with you. Now, again, not thus saith the Lord. He just saying, God's on your side, David. He's blessing you. What, what's in your heart? Go for it, man. And I think this is good encouragement. I like this. I think it's just a good friend giving good encouragement. You've got a heart to do something for God. Go for it. Well, watch what happens. But it happened that night that the word of God came to Nathan. So God now speaks to him, his word, to go say, thus saith the Lord to David. And he says, go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in. For I've not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day. It's not that he doesn't want it, there to be a temple. There'll be one later. David's just not the one to build it. He said, but I've gone from tent to tent, from one tabernacle to another, wherever I moved about with all Israel. Have I ever spoken a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? You know, where's my mansion? Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be a ruler over my people. What a great this is so rich. The least job you could have in that day, other than being a slave, and if you were a slave, you were owned, but the least job you could have was being a shepherd. That was the lowest rung of the ladder in that day. So try to imagine in your mind right now, what do you consider the least, the least job in our society today? Don't, you know, don't say that loud. But think about it. What right now, if you were to say, what is the least job in my mind of our society? Boom, put it there. That's what being a shepherd was. David said, so God said to David, that was you, David. And I saw you there. You know, and I, and I chose you to be the ruler over Israel. You ever think you can't be important? I'm just nothing, my job and my, who I am and what I've done. God, God, God says, no, I went and I did that. I took what would be considered the lowest of, of society and I raised you to be the king of Israel. That's encouraging because that means all of us are eligible to, eligible to be used in greater ways by the Lord. So it should be very encouraging no matter what you're doing. But he says, that's, you were a shepherd. You were at the lowest place. I took you. You didn't come to me. I came and I grabbed you. I took you to be a ruler over my people, Israel. And I've been with you wherever you've gone. I've cut off all your enemies from before you, have made you a name like the name of the great men on the earth. Look, we're still talking about David today. And here's the thing. It's not just David. The church alone doesn't just talk about David. The world talks about David. Even the world knows King David. They talk about King David. He's seen as one of the great rulers of the world. And so God did exactly what he said he would do. He said, I did that. I, you didn't do that, David. I did that for you. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and plant them, again, this Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. God planted them there. I love that picture. That they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppose them anymore as previously, since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. Also, I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house. Wow. Okay, this is like a blow your mind moment. God speaking directly to you. And you knew it was God because it was a prophet who was a proven prophet. Remember, you had to be proven. You had to be 100% accurate and you had to be proven over time. And it had to be thus saith the Lord. It couldn't be, I think I'm hearing the spirit. It was thus saith the Lord. So he knew he was being spoken directly to you from God. He says, you want to build me a house? I'm going to build you a house, David. But not the house that you have. You have a great palace, all that. Not, I'm not talking about a physical structure. I'm going to make, I'm going to build you a house, a kingdom and bless you and bless your family and those after you. I'm gonna establish you. And, you know, and so this would be like, you're kidding me. It's like, and again, he reminds him where he came from as being the lowest of the low. To now he's gonna make him the highest of the high in the nation, if you will, and, and, and establish him for generations. And it should be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you. So you're gonna have a son who will be of your sons and I will establish his kingdom he will build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. David, uh, God tells David in another place, you know, you, you can't build it because you've got blood on your hands. You're a warrior. Nothing wrong in that. I called you to be a warrior, but I don't want a warrior building my house of peace. War has to happen, but I want my house to represent peace, peace with God and peace among mankind. So you're not going to build it. Your son's going to build it. And he's going to be a man of peace. He's not going to be at war. He's going to live a life of peace. So he's going to be the, the one that's going to do. He's not going to have blood on his hands. Uh, and so I will establish him. Uh, well, he'll build me the house, rather. I will establish his throne forever, establish his kingdom. In verse 13, I'll be his father and he shall be my son. 
And I will, take, I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you, that is Saul. And I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever and his throne shall be established forever. Now don't be stumbled by this. This is what's called a dual prophecy. What, what does that mean? That means that God is saying two different things at two different times. You'll find it all through scripture and the more you understand scripture, you can recognize the dual prophecies when they pop up. That is, I'm talking about Solomon first. He's gonna build a house, it'll be one of your sons. But now when I talk about a son that will rule forever and ever, now it's the son of God, Jesus Christ, my son who was a descendant of David, called the son of David. So you have a dual prophecy speaking first of Solomon and also speaking of Jesus Christ in the future. He says, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Again, this just, this pulled the air out of David, pulled the wind out of him. David was just blown away by this. He was very, very humble in his own sight. He knew what God had done. He wanted to do something special for God. And yet now look what God has done for him. God did something special for him. And David, he's blown away. And now you see his response. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord. I can imagine just coming in and just sitting down. I don't know what to say. Why have you done all this for me? Who am I? And that's exactly what he says. Look, who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house? that you've brought me this far. Notice, first of all, why did I even make it to this point? Much less all this stuff you're talking about in the future. You know, there's a Psalm that they say over and over, some of the Psalms, and after they say all the great things about God, they say, Dayenu, Dayenu, Dayenu. Dayenu means that would have been enough. And the whole point of the Psalm is, even if you'd have just brought us out of Egypt, that would have been enough, Dayenu. But then you brought us through the wilderness, Dayenu, that would have been enough. Then you brought us into the land, Dayenu, that would have been enough. Then you established, and they keep going, all these things God has done. And I think that's a good thing to do when you're praying to the Lord to say, you know what, Lord, if, if you do nothing else for me, listen, do you know Jesus Christ? If you're, no, if you're here tonight and you know Jesus, I know you're here. We can verify that. <laughs> but if you're here and you know Jesus, if you're truly a believer, Dianu, if he, does, if he does nothing else ever for you, you have the greatest eternal gift that any human could ever have eternal salvation forever in the kingdom of God with all the glory that goes with it. Die, So if you're having, you know, a pity party, Lord, how come? So-and-so got a new car. Our house isn't as nice as theirs. I don't have the strength that person does and I don't look as good as they do or whatever. Die, If he does nothing else, you're the most blessed of the blessed. And if he does beyond that, then double die, right? Just let it keep going. I mean, this is the richness of the Lord. And David is saying, why have you brought me this far? And yet this was a small thing in your sight, O God. And you've also spoken of your servant's house a great while to come. And you've regarded me according to the rank of a man of high degree, O Lord God. What more can David say to you for the honor of your servant? For you know your servant. How many of us could say that tonight? I can. Why in the world have you saved me, number one? Why in the world have you let me be a pastor? You know me. I know me and you know me. Let's be real, God. We're not playing any games here. He sees everything. And I go, okay, you know me. You know all my failures and weaknesses and all my struggles and all the things. And you still called me to be a pastor? Why? Why have you done this? There's no answer other than he's just good. He's just good. He's merciful and gracious. He uses us in the midst of our weakness and our frailty and all the things that are wrong with us. He says, I'll still use you. Just be sincere with me. Give me a real heart. Give, make, give yourself as a burnt offering to me. And we'll have peace together and I'll use you. Make a morning and evening sacrifice. Learn to sing to me. Sing praises to me. Speak of me among the people. And I'll use you. Again, this is not just David's adventure. This is our adventure. This is ours. Oh, Lord, for your servant's sake and according to your own heart, you've done all this greatness in making known all these great things. Oh, Lord, there's none like you. Nor is there any God besides you, according to all that we've heard with our ears. And who is like your people, Israel? The one nation on the earth whom God went to redeem from himself as a people to make it 
for yourself a name by great and awesome deeds. That is all the things that when he brought them out of Egypt, the miracles that he did and he's done since then by driving out nations from before your people whom you redeemed from Egypt. For you have made your people Israel your very own people forever. Notice that word again, I have it underlined. God's not through with Israel. He's not through with the Jew. They rejected him, he hasn't rejected them. And he will pour his spirit out on them again and revive them after he brings them back in the land. He's brought them back in the land. He's still bringing them back in the land and God's gonna use them and revive them. They are future brothers and sisters in the Lord. And I love them. I love you, but I love them too. And, and so we are to love them. They're family. That, does that mean they do everything right? No, they don't do everything right as a nation or as individuals. That's not the point. It's not that they do everything right. They do a lot of things that are wrong. But God said they're mine forever and they're future family. You need to love them. Do we do everything right? I don't think so. But we're still family, aren't we? So we love each other. We show grace and mercy. And this is about, this is how our God is. And you, Lord, have become their God. And now, O Lord, the word which you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, let it be established forever and do as you have said. So let it be established that your name may be magnified forever, saying the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel is Israel's God. And let the house of your servant David be established before you. It reminds me of Mary when, you know, the angel came and Gabriel told her what was going to happen. She said, let it be as in what the Lord said, let it happen. Now David's saying the same thing. Okay, that's what you want to do. You know me. I don't know why you want to do this. I'm, I'm blown away, but okay, go for it. For you, oh my God, have revealed to your servant that you will build him a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, your God, and have promised this goodness to your servant. And now you've been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you've blessed it, O oh Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. So David pouring his heart out to the Lord. And now we see David getting further established in the kingdom. Chapter 18, after this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines, subdued them, took Gath and its towns from the hand of the Philistines. Now God is making David great, like he said. So David is now carrying out this greatness, defeating the enemies of, the God, of God, and now giving the land to the people that God promised. He defeated Moab. The Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. David defeated Hadadezer, king of Zobah, as far as Hamath, as he went to establish his power by the river Euphrates. Now again, that's all the way over to the border of Iraq and Iran. So we're, you'll notice how big the kingdom is here. David took from him 1,000 chariots, 7,000 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung the chariot horses. That's so they couldn't use them in battle against him. Except he spared enough of them to have 100 chariots to be useful again for the kingdom. And when the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. And then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. So the Lord preserved David wherever he went. And David took shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Tibhoth and from Shun, cities of Hadadezer, David brought a large amount of bronze with which Solomon made the bronze sea, the pillars and the articles of bronze. And when Tau, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadezer, king of Zobah, he sent Hadoram, the son of king, uh, Hadoram, his son, to king David to greet him and bless him because he had fought with Hadadezer and defeated him for Hadadezer had been at war with Tal and Hadoram brought with him all kinds of articles of gold, silver, and bronze. So this guy, you know, David defeats one of this guy's enemies and now this guy says thank you and sends him rewards for that and establishing a relationship with King David. And King David also dedicated these to the Lord along with the silver and gold that he brought from all the nations from Edom, from Moab, from the people of Ammon and from the Philistines and from Amalek. Moreover, Abishai, uh, the son of Zariah killed 18,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. He also put garrisons in Edom, and all the Edomites became David's servants. That's the Petra region down there. And the Lord preserved David wherever he went. Now, something I want you to note here, David is getting all these spoils from all these lands that he's conquering, and he's setting them aside to build the temple. David has a heart to build the temple. David doesn't get to build the temple because he has blood on his hands. But that doesn't mean that David can't get the temple ready to be built. And so this is, this is very encouraging, guys, in a number of ways. And that is this. Although David couldn't build the temple himself, there's nothing that stopped David from getting it ready so that others could build it. And what is my point in that? You may not be able to do all your heart's desire while you're down here on the earth. 
You may not get to be everything you wanted to be and all the vision that you had and all the things you thought. God's going to use you. He's going to do what he wants to do. But if you don't get to do everything that you envisioned down here, that doesn't mean that you can't prepare for those coming after you. You know, one of the things, and it's kind of a, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, I don't think it's a weird thought. I think it's a godly thought, but I don't know how much God's going to allow us to establish this land and develop this property and do everything that's going to be done here. But in my mind, I think about the next generation. When I'm gone from here, whether it's dead or whether God, something happens or, you know, I mean, whatever, and I die, I, whatever. I want the next guy that comes in here to have a foundation in place that he can take this fellowship to the next level. And so whether or not I ever get to see the level I want to see with this 43, now 42 acres or whatever that God wants to do and whatever else he wants to do, I want it to be prepared for the next generation coming along so they can take it to the next level and honor God more with it. And this is the heart that David had. He said, you know what? I can't build the temple, but I'll tell you what I can do. I can get it ready for my son. My son can build the temple. So David reigned over all Israel, administered judgment and justice to all his people. And Joab, the son of Uriah, was over the army. Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahad, Ahud, was the recorder. Um, Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Abimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests. Shabsha was the scribe. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief ministers to the king. Now, we're, we're going to go ahead and zip through 19 because it's too early to quit. But I want to, I want to try to get 19 in tonight. Notice what it says, it happened after this that Nahash, the king of the people of Ammon, died and his son reigned in his place. And David said, I'll show kindness to Hanun, the son of Nahash, because his father showed kindness to me. Now, we don't know when his father showed kindness to David, but he did at some point. And David sent messengers to comfort him concerning his father. And David's servants came to Hunan in the land of the people of Ammon to comfort him. Now, no doubt it was when David was on the run from Saul somewhere in the wilderness. And so this guy was, showed kindness to David, no matter, maybe sent food to him or protected him or something. And so he says, hey, I'm going to comfort them because this man was nice to me. So he sends a message to them over there in Jordan, modern day Jordan today. And the princes of the people of Ammon said to Hunan, do you think that David really honors your father because he sent comforters to you? Did his servants not come to search out and overflow, or rather overthrow and spy out the land? In other words, they accused David. He says, he's not really helping you or sending you a blessing. He's spying on you so he can defeat you. So a false accusation. And it's going to get this guy in a lot of trouble. It's going to get this kingdom in a lot of trouble. <laughs> you don't mess with David. Therefore, Hunan took David's servants, shaved them, and cut off their garments in the middle at their buttocks and sent them away. It's pretty graphic. Their beard was a big deal to them. The beard was a sign of their relationship to their nation, their people, who they were. And so he shaves their beard off, cuts off their garments in the back where their backside's showing and sends them away humiliated. I mean, this is not the thing you want to do to David's servants, especially when David's sending a blessing to you. So you can imagine what's going to happen, and you're right. Then some went and told David about the men. Now look at David's heart. I love his, he sent to them and said, because these men are greatly ashamed. And the king said, wait at Jericho until your beards have grown, then return. He says, you know what? You stay there. Let your beard return. Come back with honor. Don't come back with shame. I'll fight for you. I'll defend you. If they offended you, they attacked you, they're attacking me. And this is a great attitude to have, guys, with other believers in the, in the kingdom. If one of us is attacked, we're all attacked. And David had that attitude. He says, I'm going to defend you. And so when the people there saw that they had made themselves repulsive to David, Hanun, the people of, of Ammon, sent a thousand talents of silver to hire for themselves chariots and horsemen from Mesopotamia, from Syria, Macon, and from Zobah. And they hired for themselves 32,000 chariots with the king of Macon and his people who came in the camp before Mediba. And the people of Ammon gathered together from their cities and came to battle. And David heard of it, sent Joab and all the army of the mighty men. And the people of Ammon came out and put themselves in battle array at the gate of the city. And the kings who had come were by, uh, were by themselves in the field. And when Joab saw that the battle line was against him before and behind, so they had two different camps set up against David's people, he chose some of Israel's best and put them in battle array against the Syrians. And the rest of the people he put under the command of Abishai, his brother, and they set themselves in battle array against the people of Ammon. And he said, if the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the people of Ammon are too strong for you, then I will help you. I love this verse. Be of good courage and let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God and may the Lord do what is right in his sight. Listen, we are fighting for God. They've offended God. They've attacked our people. Let's go. Whatever happens, happens. I know they've got battle lines on all sides, but you know what? God's with us. And I'll tell you something. When you know God's with you, even when the odds are against you, you go out with great courage. And this is what he's doing. He's like, you know what? Let's go. Rah! You know, I love it. It's, this is great. This is warrior spirit. And Joab and his people who were with him drew near for battle against the Syrians and they fled before them. And when the people saw Ammon, 
While the people of Ammon saw the Syrians were fleeing, they also fled before Abishai's brother and entered the city. So Joab went to Jerusalem. And when the Syrians saw they had been defeated by Israel, they sent messengers and brought the Syrians who were beyond the river. And Shopak, uh, the commander of Hadadezer's army, went before them. And it was told David, he gathered all Israel, crossed over the Jordan, came upon them, set up in battle array against them. So when David had set up in battle array against the Syrians, they fought with him and the Syrians fled before Israel. And David killed 7,000 charioteers and 40,000 foot soldiers of the Syrians, killed Shopak, the commander of the army. And when the servants of Hadadezer saw they were defeated by Israel, they made peace with David and became his servants. So the Syrians were not willing to help the people of Ammon anymore. <laughs> Isn't that great? They beat us to death. You're on your own. We're not helping you anymore. I told you we get to that chapter quickly. But guys, again, what a, what a great portion of scripture. Again, to recap the things I think to burn in your mind, David put God first and then God established David. Put God first, God will establish you. But once you're established, realize the enemies of God will come against you. The Philistines will rise up. Don't be afraid. God will give you the victory. You go into battle with courage, fighting for God. He'll give you the victory and God will establish you. So, so many rich truths from the word tonight. And just a great portion of scripture. Again, read the next three or four chapters. So you're ahead and ready to go next week. We'll continue on in the adventure of David. But let's just pray tonight that, you know, God will help us to continue on in the adventure he's given us. You know, God has given you an adventure. I don't know what he's called you to do. You can miss the adventure. If you don't seek God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you just live your own life, you can miss the adventure. But if you give God a burnt offering, and you receive that peace that comes in that peace offering from God afterwards. And you say, Lord, I want what you have for me. You're going to have an adventure. I can guarantee you that. And God will lead you into steps of faith. He'll lead you into some very exciting, successful times. You'll be at times you feel defeated. But by the time you get to the kingdom, you're going to look back on all of it and realize God was right in the middle of it. And you know what? What a better way to live your life down here than living all out for God than just living for ourselves. Because remember, what's the ultimate thing that's going to happen? We're all going to die one day soon because we're, you, we, none of us live that long. Not a relation to eternity and time. And guess what's going to happen? We're going to stand before Jesus. And it's not going to be about what level we got to in that video game or how much money we saved up or how good our sports team did, what a great fan we were, None of that's going to matter. We're not going to stand before the Lord and think, yeah, well, you know, I got to you know, level five. I mean, what did we do for him? And to be able to stand before him and say, I know I failed a lot, but I tried to offer myself as a burnt offering. Lord, you know the truth. You know me. Whatever I gave, I gave, and I'll let you sort it out. But I, I, I gave my life to serve you rather than serving the world and serving myself. There's not going to be any greater reward, guys, standing before the Lord than to do that. And that's what we need to ask God to do in our hearts. Let's pray. Father, I do pray tonight that that would be our heart's desire, Lord, to be a burnt offering unto you, totally given over to you, totally sold out to you, yours completely in every way. I thank you for all the fun things you give us down here, Lord, and all the adventures that we have and personal projects and all that stuff. It's great. But God, I pray that our heart's desire would be to be prepared for the day we stand before you knowing that we gave ourselves as a burnt offering, that we offered the morning and evening sacrifice, or that we proclaimed your name among the people, that we sang to you in the heavens. Lord, all of that is going to be acknowledged and rewarded when we stand before you one day. And so, Lord, let us, let us look forward to it and to move forward boldly in it uh, giving you all the glory and honor. And I thank you again for just the encouragement, Lord, that you've given us tonight in your word, Lord. And help us now to zero in on the adventure that you've called us to do for you as well. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship the Lord. God bless you guys.